Hey class, it is Mr. Shrum, and I am going to go through another tutorial for bio, and this one's all about cycles in ecosystems. And let's get started. So the objective for this tutorial is that you will explain how the cycling of matter and energy interacts with a biological process. Multiple biological processes, actually. And here we're given the tutorial contents. And as usual, we're given a warm up question. An obligate anaerobe is an organism that would die in an oxygenated environment. What could be assumed about these organisms? So if they are in an oxygenated environment, um, that would mean that they can only perform things that don't involve oxygen, right? Uh, and let's see this explanation for further details. Anaerobic respiration is a form of cellular respiration that produces energy, but occurs in the absence of oxygen. So it's respiration, but um, no oxygen is needed. So organisms that are intolerant to oxygen, they can use this to obtain the energy needed to sustain life uh, the way we do with oxygen. And we'll learn more about that. Earth is made up of made up of four main spheres. The geosphere refers to rocks, minerals, and natural landforms. What do you think makes up the hydrosphere? And why is the hydrosphere so important on Earth? So um, hydro, if you think of words like hydrate, that prefix is, is associated with water. So the hydrosphere consists of rivers, lakes, oceans, glaciers, uh, and groundwater found in the earth and on the earth. It's important because water is a basic necessity for living things. Aquatic life forms rely on bodies of water for their habitat. So an entire life form, aquatic life, requires water to even exist. Like their whole environment has to be water. So let's look at the four main spheres in more detail. All life on Earth is connected, but life is also connected to non-living parts of the environment as well. So landforms, water, air, and organisms each make up one of the four spheres of Earth. The geosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the biosphere. So each of those are associated with the sphere. Landforms, geosphere, water, hydrosphere, air, atmosphere, biosphere, organisms. And these spheres interact to perform all of Earth's processes. So any change in one sphere will affect the other sphere, most likely. And let's get into each sphere. So the hydrosphere, it includes all water present on and near the surface of Earth. We've discussed that water covers almost 70% of Earth. And of all that water, 97% is salt water found in the oceans. Only 3% is fresh water that you find in 
in lakes, and that is suitable for humans to drink and use for other activities such as farming and, and washing. So this is found in lakes, rivers, and groundwater. Think of like wells. More than two thirds of the fresh water available exists in solid form as ground ice. And that includes permafrost, if you remember from the uh, taiga uh, forests in the last lesson. So this is soil or rock that is usually bound by ice and remains permanently frozen for at least uh, two years. And this is usually found in really high altitudes or um, polar regions towards the North Pole. And here we go. So we get a visual of all the total global water, most of it's ocean, other salt water, and then fresh water. And then of that fresh water, see, of that fresh water, we have glaciers and ice caps making up the majority. Then we have groundwater. And then we have surface and other fresh water. And of that surface water and other fresh water, that is made up of ground ice and permafrost, lakes, rivers, swamps, marshes, atmosphere, and living things. Next, the atmosphere is made up of mixtures of gases, commonly called air, and it just surrounds Earth, all of Earth. It extends from the Earth's surface and becomes thinner as it merges with space. Based on temperature, the atmosphere is divided into five layers. The troposphere uh, is the lower atmosphere and it's just above Earth's surface. And that, that makes up 70 to 80% of Earth's atmosphere. Most of Earth's weather occurs in the troposphere. troposphere. Now let's look at the gases that make up this particular lower atmosphere region. So atmospheric gases, nitrogen and oxygen are the dominant gases. The remaining 1% uh, consists of what we call trace gases, such as carbon dioxide, water vapor, and argon. So this nitrogen, denoted by this symbol, N, is the most abundant gas in our atmosphere. About almost 80% is nitrogen. It is essential for the nutrition of all living things. It's a major component of all proteins and of our genetic material known as DNA. Plants absorb nitrogen from the air and soil Animals consume plants and animals to obtain nitrogen. Argon is the most abundant of the trace gases. Um, it is a noble gas, an inert gas, gas. And that means it tends not to chemically react with other substances. Noble and inert means that those elements and gases are, they're okay. Um, they have enough uh, electrons in their valence or outermost shell. And so they don't really need to interact with things around it chemically. That's why we call them a noble inert. Then we have um, carbon dioxide in the trace gas denoted by CO2. I think that's, you guys are most familiar with this. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It's essential in small amounts because it helps keep earth warm, making it habitable by us and other animals. Plants require carbon dioxide for photosynthesis as well. And other living organisms, so we, excrete carbon dioxide as a waste product of respiration. 
and that contributes to the amount of CO2 in the air. And a, a greenhouse gas is a compound that helps keep Earth warm by trapping heat from the sun. Uh, sunlight is a major form of energy on Earth. Greenhouse gases, which include CO2, water vapor, methane, that's another one you may have heard of, allow sunlight to freely pass through the atmosphere. And most of the energy absorbed by Earth is radiated back into space. So these gases let sunlight pass through the atmosphere. And then Earth radiates that energy back into space. But on the way back, these greenhouse gases absorb some of this energy that is radiated back. And so with that energy, the atmosphere and Earth are warmer than it otherwise would be. So greenhouse gases uh, trap in heat, and that helps the Earth, making it habitable. However, too much of a good thing can be bad. So um, human activities such as using fossil fuels, deforestation, which means uh, uh, breaking down forests, clearing forests for um, farming and other uses, industrial processes have increased the levels of greenhouse gases, especially CO2 in the atmosphere. And that has led to too much warming of the Earth's surface and increasing the overall global temperature. And with an increase in global temperature, you begin to see erratic and unpredictable weather behavior and climate change. Um, so it's not necessarily that the Earth's just getting warm and that's bad, but there are other broader effects that can hurt our, our civilizations as we know it. And then photosynthesis, photosynthesis, plants and other organisms, uh, they can transform radiant energy into chemical energy, which is pretty cool. I uh, wish humans could do that. Uh, water vapor, I don't think I read this. Water vapor is always present in the atmosphere, but um, the volume of water vapor in the air can vary with location, time, and day. So air in desert regions, they have less water vapor overall, but in say the tropical rainforest, there's more water vapor in the air at every, any given time. Oxygen, so that occupies about 20% of the air. Almost all living organisms need oxygen to survive. Uh, most eukaryotes and certain prokaryotes are aerobes. And aerobes need oxygen for cellular respiration, uh, which involves breaking down food compounds to generate energy in the form of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. So if we click on cellular respiration, um, we get a metabolic process within cells that converts nutrients into ATP. So within your cells, this is happening. Adenosine triphosphate is a biomolecule found in the cells. Um, that is a form of energy. Most aerobic respiration reactions occur in mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, alternatively, some eukaryotes are capable of performing anaerobic respiration for a short period of time. So this does not require oxygen. Humans undergo anaerobic respiration when you're exercising really hard and um, your muscle cells need energy uh, quickly, but relatively less energy is produced by anaerobic respiration 
So humans can't really sustain this for very long. And that's why um, your muscles get tired and past a certain point, your, your body just can't handle certain things. So humans are obligate aerobes. And that just means we need oxygen for survival and growth long-term. Just as obligate aerobes need oxygen, certain organisms uh, do not require any oxygen at all. So prokaryotes, uh, not very many of them need oxygen to, to survive. Um, and they can die when there's oxygen present. So they are called obligate anaerobes. And that just means they use anaerobic respiration uh, all the time. Some prokaryotes and eukaryotes can generate energy through aerobic respiration if oxygen is present, but can also perform anaerobic respiration when there's not oxygen. So these kind of mixed people are facultative anaerobes. And facultative Think of that as a, like you're more adaptable, like if oxygen is there, you can use it. But if it's not, then you're still able to survive. And if you're obligate, obligate means you, you need to be anaerobic and an obligate aerobe means you need, you need oxygen. Obligate anaerobes need to not be in the presence of oxygen. And then facultative, anaerobes can do both. So in this lesson, you're going to practice identifying and differentiating between obligate aerobes that need oxygen, obligate anaerobes that don't need oxygen, and facultative anaerobes, which can use both oxygen and and they can function when there's not oxygen present as well. So you'll, you'll do that. And then you'll also determine the atmospheric conditions that are needed for the survival of obligate aerobes such as humans. So we have three test tubes on a rack. These specks represent microorganisms that live in the test tube. Study the image and then answer the questions that follow. So in the tube, the oxygen is going to be concentrated the highest at the top and lowest at the bottom. So if you see these specks are more towards the high oxygen, these guys are obligate aerobes. And if you see these microorganisms congregating around the bottom, they are obligate anaerobes. And then in tube C, you can, there's a, a wider spread, you see. These guys are tightly packed together. These people are tightly packed together. But, but these guys are more spread out. So I believe they are facultative anaerobes because they can, they can use oxygen over here, but they can also hang out in um, non-oxygen areas. We are obligate anaerobes, or we are obligate aerobes. Humans are obligate aerobes. They need oxygen. So uh, tube A is our closest the closest thing that represents us. So that answers number three. Um, part B, many space scientists are working hard to send a manned mission to Mars in the near future. And we are given Mars atmosphere. So oh, a lot of carbon dioxide, over 95%, a little bit of nitrogen, argon, and oxygen. And I want you to explain why humans wouldn't be able to survive in Mars atmosphere. 
without special equipment that would um, provide oxygen to us, like a spacesuit of some sort. But um, if you see oxygen is only 0.13%, uh, that's a very low percentage. Uh, so if any of us stepped onto Mars, we would just die instantly, uh, suffocate, and then self-evaluate. Next sphere, geosphere. So here we're talking about rocks, soil, landforms, like mountains and volcanoes. The geosphere is crucial to Earth's processes. Plants acquire nutrients from soil, for example, and then humans extract most of their fuel and minerals from the ground. So the geosphere is a part of Earth's ecosystems and it supports plants and animals, uh, animals like us, humans. Many of these organisms have evolved special adaptations that allow them to live in and around certain landforms. Oh, cute. Um, yeah, so mountain goats. Let's see what they have adapted to, to live in high altitudes. So they are found in mountains of Northwestern North America. Their fur is thick and woolly, and this keeps them warm in the cold and harsh climate. Their hooves are flexible and rubber-like. So if you've ever seen a mountain uh, go, go up a mountain very fast, it's, it is very impressive. You're like, they don't look all that like flexible and movable, but they, they can get up a mountain. Their lungs are also larger, so they can store more air at a higher altitude. And this is necessary because when you get high enough in, in altitude, the air um, contains less oxygen up there. So the goat's hearts, plural hearts, are incredibly efficient and work hard to deliver oxygen-rich blood more evenly. So in a cold, high-altitude climate, the mountain goat over time has adapted and they are better suited for this environment. Like mountain goats, many organisms have adaptations that help them live in tough conditions. But there are some environments where it seems impossible for any organism to survive. The organisms that actually do live in such extreme conditions are called extremophiles or extremophiles. They can thrive in extreme environments, uh, which can include high temperatures, very high salt concentrations, and then high pressure. So for example, in 2012, scientists discovered bacteria that lived in South American volcanoes. So surviving in a hot acidic environment, uh, they're still not sure how they can do this, but they, they think it's in their DNA. The DNA sequences of these bacteria differ by almost 5% from other species, which is a big deal. Um, most, most species of anything have pretty similar uh, DNA sequences. So the fact that it's 5% different could mean that these bacteria developed adaptations to survive harsh conditions in a volcano. Uh, over here, we have a picture of hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. And they're brightly colored because of tiny, tiny microorganisms that can survive in very high temperatures. So those are all little, little organisms. Okay, our last sphere 
to talk about is the biosphere. And the biosphere encompasses all living organisms on Earth, as well as their body processes that influence the other three spheres. So these processes include photosynthesis, cellular respiration, and the excretion of waste, good old waste. The four spheres of Earth are interconnected and working together in some way. The biological processes of living things interact with and affect um, all three hydrosphere, atmosphere, and geosphere. So when we breathe in oxygen and use it for bodily processes, and then we exhale carbon dioxide, um, we're in a cycle. Uh, so we take in oxygen produced by plants and the atmosphere, and then we exhale carbon dioxide, which is then used by plants to live. So it's a very mutual relationship. We also depend on the hydrosphere for our water needs. And then the plants extract nutrients from the soil and humans extract food, minerals, and fuel from the soil. 